how fallacies undermine arguments and why everyone should avoid them as much as possible. An essay by Martin Resny. Is it true that every argument ultimately rests on a fallacy? It very well might be. But does it mean that fallacies are good? Or that more fallacies make arguments better? The main question asked by Sean Norton is how a logical fallacy undermines an argument. What is the proof of that? And ideally one that doesn't also rest on a fallacy, in the sense of something that quacks like a proof, but doesn't actually substantiate anything. Well, let me try. For example, definitions, explanations of what words mean, shouldn't be circular, like using a fancy word to quote, define, unquote, its ordinary synonym. Which is why you shouldn't quote, define, unquote, rust as corrosion, because that explains nothing. Instead, a sensible, useful definition of rust would go something like this. A reddish or yellowish-brown flaking coating of iron oxide that is formed on iron or steel by oxidation, especially in the presence of moisture. There are many ways in which one can make a more sensible definition, explaining what category the thing falls under, how it differs from other members of the category, how the thing came to be, what is it an opposite of, etc. Ultimately, though, if you've had a chain of definitions that's long enough, it's quite possible that it would always form a closed loop. My question is, does that mean that an immediately circular definition is more useful? And the same goes for a circular argument, which is a logical fallacy. You can have an immediate one, like the Bible proving that it is the Word of God, because God says so in the Bible, and the Bible is the Word of God, and so on. Or you can have one which loops into a circle after a couple more steps, like the one that we all have to deal with every day. One, I need to make money because, two, people will only sell me the things I need for money, because, three, they need money, because, four, people like me will only sell things to them for money, etc. The trick is, simply because money exists, this whole loop does. The problem with this fallacy is that it distracts people from what the actual cause is for the whole situation, or from the more important greater context to consider. Giving someone a circular argument as proof is usually done to make someone believe something or take action without really thinking about it or understanding what's going on. What's much more useful regarding these examples is to consider and debate whether it makes sense to have faith or base an economy on money in the first place, not to accept either as fact. Some logical fallacies used in personal conversation are just harmless expressions of one's subjective experience or an honest error. But in the public sphere, fallacious arguments are typically used manipulatively as part of efforts to spread ideology. As for what they undermine and how, it's not an either-or proposition, and it's not just about the validity of arguments. An argument is undermined to a degree to which it is based exclusively, immediately, unnecessarily or outright manipulatively on fallacies, and excessively or intentionally fallacious arguments undermine discourses. If you start from the beginning, with Descartes' absolute doubt, you can argue that even to trust our sensory perceptions is fallacious. The only thing we really know is that we exist, but to doubt so much isn't generally useful. One has to at least trust their perception, to a degree, and a society has to trust some institutions, to a degree and with safeguards, to actually be able to do anything. With that said, however, there is such a thing as more or less dubious authority to begin with, or more or less reliable forms of evidence. Personally, I think it is healthy to doubt even the consensus of scientific authorities, but not absolutely. The understanding of logical fallacies is what allows one to determine which specific arguments are better or worse, more or less certain to be factually correct or ethically sound. A claim can be based on an emotion, an intuition, a faith, an experience, a testimony, a consensus, a logical inference, an observation, an experiment, a series of observations and experiments, a huge body of either, 
and possibly other things. Clearly, these are not factual proofs of equal weight, and it's not always about proof. Take, for example, a logical fallacy called non sequitur, its informal general version, which is when a following statement doesn't logically follow from a preceding statement, or they lack any meaningful mutual relation between each other. When you say, for example, that we should legalize marijuana because mustaches, the issue isn't so much that the argument doesn't substantiate the suggestion, it's that the argument doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Sometimes, the way in which a fallacy undermines an argument is that it confuses it and therefore sabotages the communication attempt. So, how can I prove that there are more or less factually correct or ethical authorities, or that fallacies are being used to manipulate people with harmful personal and social consequences, or that fallacies make arguments more confusing and therefore all communication less effective? I do have my experience, intuitions and logical inferences. A lot of people who are not experts have those too, and there are expert opinions and studies to point to. I could doubt any or all of that and see it as based on fallacies like appeals to authority or ad populum, the belief of many. But what's the alternative? If all of the available evidence together overwhelmingly leads to one conclusion, I guess I could have faith that all of it is wrong, but comparatively, logic dictates that doubt would be a more fallacious position, more likely to be incorrect. As an experienced competitive debater, I know from over a decade of experience why speakers use particular kinds of arguments, especially the fallacious ones, and as a general rule, it's not random. I could choose to disregard this experience, and that it makes logical sense to use arguments as tools to quote, win, unquote, debates, and affect people's beliefs and actions. But what for? Let's look at specific harms of some other common logical fallacies. A. False dilemma. The goal, or unintended negative side effect of this fallacy, is to undermine people's ability to accurately consider all of their choices. It may be true that it's impossible to communicate absolutely all of the available choices, at least in any single argument, but so what? Languages, especially the informal natural ones, don't allow perfect completeness of expression in any situation. That only explains why continuous discourse is so important. Acknowledging the existence of fewer choices is never helpful. B. Slippery slope this kind of fallacy undermines the people's ability to soberly and rationally consider the consequences of individual actions or changes in policies. While the inability to connect the dots between an initial cause and the ultimate result may be due to error rather than intentional manipulation, slippery slopes that warn against negative consequences stimulate fear, and slippery slopes that promise paradise appeal to blind faith. Either way, Use of slippery slopes makes debates and policies more irrational. C. Strawman While even this fallacy can happen by accident rather than by design, it is based entirely on the undermining of positions and reputations. Nothing constructive can be learned or solved through shallow criticism of caricatures. While it may be impossible to ever represent somebody else's position absolutely precisely, the continuous striving to clarify and accurately represent positions of others is what's needed to improve a discourse. Parody may be entertaining, but it becomes less so when it turns into prejudice. D. No true Scotsman The usual intent of this fallacy may be opposite to what a straw man is trying to accomplish, to protect reputation rather than damage it, but at the cost of undermining the ability to hold groups of people responsible for the negative consequences of their beliefs and actions. In order for groups to correct their governing policies and ultimately the behavior of their members, the members themselves must be able to acknowledge that something's wrong. As long as it's somebody else's fault, the fault remains. I could go on forever because there's no shortage of different types of logical fallacies, but I think that by now I have made my point. While I do concede that it may be impossible to ever fully rid human discourse of logical fallacies, available evidence clearly points to the fact that their use does undermine it in a number of ways. This is especially true if they're used intentionally to manipulate people, but their effects are the same no matter why they're used. At the very least, 
It is clear that fewer fallacies are better than more fallacies, certainly beyond the necessary unavoidable level. At that minimal level, technically fallacious informal arguments may be used as axioms, communication shortcuts, or ways of dealing with impractically excessive existential doubt. But even then, the ability to understand what logical fallacies are and avoid using them excessively is essential as a tool to defend oneself from being manipulated and to improve the quality of any discourse.